Episode 3, Along the Coast to Mexica Lands. Last time, in Episode 2, we trace Cortez from his upbringing in Extremadura, Spain, through his participation in genocide in Cuba and Hispaniola, to the shores of Maya country, where he decimated the armies of Chief Top Scoob. March 1519 Word of the Spanish victory over the Yocotan Maya armies of Chief Tabscu was spreading, and with it, fear, as Hernan Cortez began to turn his gaze toward the Mexica and their gold. The wide, clean avenues of Tenochtitlan were filled with the normal bustle of any day in the capital, but in the palace, a unique and gripping terror held Moctezuma. Reports of a shattering blow to their Maya trading partners in the south had reached the Mexica king. The main force of the combined Yocotan Maya, under the leadership of Tabscub, had failed to slow the Spanish invaders. This was a catastrophic blow to the order of life in Mesoamerica. A shift had occurred, a reordering of power and structure so massive that the course of history was already off on a wildly different tangent than any Maya or Mexica could have expected. Moctezuma kept the knowledge of this dramatic event to his council and leadership. In the streets of Tenochtitlan, life carried on. Neatly dressed young women in their white cotton huipiles, their shiny black hair tightly bound in buns, still vied for the attention of the young men, who vied right back. Farmers pushed seeds into the moist ground of the man-made chinampas for the summer harvest. The flatboats moved goods and people about the city, their navigators stepping up onto bridges and back down to the boats as they passed under. On the lake, fishermen continued to harvest fish and aquasiles, a local crayfish. Life in the sunny streets and canals carried on outside the royal palace. Part 1. Closing out business in Potonchan. In the humid coastal lowlands of Tabasco, the Maya people of Potonchan began to return from the forests where they'd been hiding, to their scarred village. All the thatched roofs had been burned, furniture destroyed, statuary and pottery smashed and broken. Cortez had demanded the people return, but it was not his intent to destroy them. At first, cautious and weary, the men returned. They cleaned the town, swept out the ash, removed the burnt wood, and began to collect new grass to weave new roofs. Women and children returned in the days that followed. With them returned the sense of home, hearth fires, cooked tortillas, and maize cakes. Fabscoob sent caravans of turkeys, vegetables, and gold to Cortez. In the sacred plaza, the old gods were removed from the main temple, a modest three-step pyramid. Crosses replaced them. When the Maya people fled Potonchan before the Spanish took the town and before the Battle of Sintla, they were the Yocotan Maya of Potonchan. When they returned, they would have to become the Christians of Santa Maria de la Victoria. Father Olmedo was ordered to explain the blessings of the Catholic faith of the Virgin Mary and her son Jesus Christ to the twenty slave women that had been gifted to Cortez. He then baptized the women, making them the first female converts in what would become mainland Mexico. Cortez then gifted the women to his captains and best men. One of the women, whose name was Malincin, had been baptized with the Christian name Marina. She was given to Captain Alonso Puerto Querero, one of Cortez's most loyal captains. More than one man noted that she stood out for her physical beauty, but also she had a certain self-assured way about her. Marina's eyes looked through words to see the truth in motivations. Perhaps as a bilingual Maya and Nahuatl speaker, she had come to rely as much on the universal physical cues of conversation, which often speak more truthfully than words. Or perhaps as a woman from the upper castes of the Kotashla region, she knew the politics of words. Malincin, an indigenous noblewoman from a small coastal town, would soon take her place at the side of Cortez and at the top of the political hierarchy of the new world that was to come. For now, she kept her vital skill hidden. Several days after the battle, while Cortez's men rested, Chief Tabscoob and a delegation of about 40 Maya leaders came to speak with Cortez. 
They were greeted respectfully. They had come to ask permission to collect their dead and to end hostilities. The Maya men reported up to 800 missing men. Cortez granted them this dignity and moved on to more devout conversations about where the gold was. Tobscoob revealed that the Kaluans had much more gold than the Maya. Kalua was their word for the people of the Valley of Mexico, whom they traded with on occasion. Cortez's probing questions about the gold, where it came from and how much there was, found few answers from the Maya. Their porous geology didn't offer much in precious minerals. Cortez asked Tobscoob why he attacked them, but the previous year had traded peacefully with the Spanish captain Juan de Grijalva. Tobscoob replied that his brother, Mochquo, chief of the nearby town of Chompaton, had criticized him for not driving Grijalva away when the people of Chompaton had fought valiantly against Cordoba in 1517 and Grijalva in 1518. Familial solidarity seemed a fair excuse for the hostility. War was like sport to Cortez, who could quickly move past the savagery of battle into strategic empathy for his enemy, like a football coach breaking down the opponent's understandable attempt at defense and strategy. On Palm Sunday, 1519, Cortez ordered Father Olmedo to hold mass, to put on a big show. Maya leaders attended. Father Olmedo and the priest Juan Diaz led the holiest procession this troop could muster. Olmedo had the vestments brought from the ship, and led the Spanish and Maya through the dusty streets of Santa Maria de la Victoria, up the main avenue to the small pyramid upon which sat the newly consecrated altar. Maya leaders and headmen from Chompaton, Potonchan, Sintla, and other towns came with their families and gathered at the foot of the strange new altar and watched Mass. The priest's sweat bled into the silks along his neck and mixed with the dust as he spoke. The recently freed Maya captive, a Spaniard named Aguilar, translated Olmedo's sermon into Maya. A group of Maya men and women were baptized in front of the assembled villagers. The former priests of the Maya gods were taught how to care for the altars and symbols of their new faith and to keep fresh flowers around the altar. Having saved souls and collected gold, Cortez ordered his men to depart for San Juan de Alua the next day. Part 2. Aztec Territory at San Juan de Alua It might seem like a dream appointment, sitting on a wooden tower overlooking an obscure bay on the tropical coast for days on end, but to this man who had been sitting there day after day, it felt unproductive, a waste of his time. He had a farm near Kotashla, and he'd prefer to be there, but his governor, Tentlil, said that Moctezuma wanted to be on the lookout should another expedition of the foreigners show up. So he sat, day after day, right up until March of 1519, when several small dots appeared along the southern coast. The sentry stood up, the dots grew bigger, and soon the man could make out the sails and wooden hulls of three, five, eight, eleven ships. In 1517, Captain Francisco Hernandez de Cordoba made the first coastal exploration of what would be Mexico. He was mortally wounded by the Maya of Champaton and fled back to Cuba, where he died of his wounds. He never made it to Aztec territory. The next year, in 1518, Captain Juan de Grijalva contacted Aztec representatives, including Tentlil and a man named Pinotl, at San Juan de Olua. As a result, Moctezuma commissioned a great number of gold, silver, and jade pieces, feather shields, and other precious featherworks which were just as highly valued as the precious stones and metals. The best silversmiths in Azcapotzalco were called upon to work on the many pieces commissioned. Goldsmiths in Tenochtitlan worked to craft pictorials, bracelets, earplugs, statues, and other works of art. Among the treasures was a large golden sun disc with intricately crafted relief work displaying figures and animals. A similar moon disc was also crafted by the silversmiths. Each disc was about the size of a wagon wheel. Cortez described them as 28 hands across. Writing after the fact, Gomara estimated their value at 20,000 ducats, a common gold coin currency at the time in Europe. 
Rijalva left before the treasures were completed, but they were kept for when and if these strangers appeared again. Moctezuma intended to send this treasure to them as a welcome gift, and if the gods were kind, a parting gift as well. Sentries had been posted along the Mexica-controlled coastline since Grijalva left for Cuba, and they were to report any sightings immediately. And then, the day before Good Friday, 1519, in the Aztec year of one reed, they appeared again. Having spotted the ships, the sentry took off to notify a chain of officials. First, the sentry went to Katashla, about 30 miles inland, where he notified the regional administrator, Tentlil who was part of the envoy who had spoken to Juan de Grijalva the year before. Katashla was culturally separate from the Maya or Mexica. However, its people were Nahuatl speakers and loyal allies to Moctezuma and the Triple Alliance in the Valley of Mexico. Within a few hours of the Spanish arriving near the dunes of San Juan de Alua, canoes from the local Aztec outposts were in the water and offering to trade small, personal things or food. A group of Spanish had landed on the mainland where they began to trade with the coastal people. By the next day, Good Friday, Cortez had begun to offload his men, the horses, and the artillery. The Taino slaves they had brought from Cuba immediately got to work cutting trees and building shelters and fire pits in the windy and swampy dunes. From Catasla, in the lowland watershed of the Sierra Madre Mountains, a runner carried the message of the Spanish arrival west toward Tenochtitlan, out of the farmland of the green foothills up into the desert highlands. Eventually, after two days, the message passed south of the volcano Popocatapetl, through the city of Cholula, then north into the Valley of Mexico, past Chalco and along the Ixtapalapa Causeway, to the Mexica capital, Tenochtitlan. The runner entered the palace of Moctezuma near the sacred precinct and asked to be admitted to see the emperor. After blessings and incense, the messenger was admitted to the council chamber. Moctezuma looked down on the messenger as he was escorted into the chamber, eyes cast to the ground. Very few people in certain specific circumstances were allowed to look at the face of the Tlatuani. Moctezuma, lord of Tenochtitlan, Tlatuani of the Mexica people and Huey Tlatuani of the Triple Alliance exuded a calm dignity, but inside he was anxious. Reports of devastating conflict to the south had already reached his ears, but intelligence on the current location of the Spanish had gone dark. What message do you have? Moctezuma asked, although in his heart he already knew. The messenger explained the men on the mountainous ships had returned. Some of the local people had been trading with them for their peculiar blue jewels. He went on to tell the emperor that Tentlil, the regional governor from the area, had been informed and was preparing to officially receive the visitors. Without showing alarm, Moctezuma looked through the pillars of his palace across Lake Texcoco to the hills beyond which Cortez was waiting. He breathed in deeply and slowly. Then he called for the other two Triple Alliance leaders. Kakama of Texcoco, and Toto Kihuatzli of Tlacopan. His high military advisor, Kwapiatl, was also there. These men all wore shabby cloaks over their normal fineries, a sign of humility before the Tlatuani. With his council convened, the lords of the Triple Alliance together discussed the situation. The burdened king confided that these visitors had him worried. The other lords tried to soothe Moctezuma to calm his worries. Different options were discussed, from financial tribute to all-out war. But for now, Moctezuma's pacifist approach of friendship would be the strategy. It was decided that Quetlalpitoc, a high-ranking attendant, would take the great treasures made for Grijalva and go to Katashla to meet Tentlil. From Katashla, the envoy would go to the Spanish, present the treasure, and ask them to leave in friendship. But Moctezuma did not understand Cortez, nor the hunger in his heart. Part 3. Marina Reveals Herself On Good Friday, 1519, boats continued making runs from the ships to the beach with supplies and people for the camp. Cortez had offloaded most of his supplies, men, horses, and the artillery. Crates of food, barrels of salt pork, tents, a few tables and chairs, and other supplies were carefully loaded into the boats. 
rowed across the water, and carried above the surf onto the beach. The camp was alive with activity as captains shouted orders on where things went. Soldiers wandered the perimeter as curious about the landscape as the threats that it may hide. Marina found herself mingling amidst some of the local Mexica traders. They spoke Nahuatl, a new and different language to most of the Spanish. Few of the men had been with Grijalva the year before and had seen Pinotal and Tentlil. The Aztec language was not new to Marina, who was raised in a Nahuatl household. As a captive of the Maya, she had learned to speak their language, making her bilingual. She began to converse with the Nahuatl men in camp. She was the only person in the Cortez expedition force that could speak Nahuatl, the language of the Aztec Triple Alliance. Some of the men noticed her talking, but did not quite connect the dots. Easter Sunday, 1519 Tentlil arrived in the dunes outside a small village called Chalchihuayacan and greeted Cortez with the customary bow, incense blessing, and a presentation of straws dipped in blood, drawn from his own forearm. He was a middle-aged man, thin with salt and pepper hair, and he wore the clean cloak of a lord, tied over one shoulder. He had brought a few hundred porters with food and gifts, including a small box of gold from his own treasury. Cortez greeted him kindly and exchanged some small gifts, including his finely woven Flemish hat, a pair of capes, and a steel knife. It was immediately clear that communication was a barrier. Geronimo de Aguilar, the former Maya prisoner, only spoke Maya, and he was struggling to communicate, using more hand gestures than words. I saw the girl speaking to them, said a Spanish soldier. The soldier pointed to her, and immediately Marina was brought to Cortez and Aguilar. Do you speak their language? Aguilar asked her in Maya. Yes, it's my language, she replied. She would not be away from Cortez again throughout the next year. The fortuitousness of the Spanish to receive such a valuable gift is remarkable. In all the reckless courage and courageous foolishness that Cortez summoned in 1519, a healthy dose of luck seems to have followed him, as if his patron St. Peter was, in fact, looking out for him. There are other bilingual people recorded in Mesoamerica, but for Cortez, she was a living Rosetta Stone, the key to unlocking communication with his target people, the Nahuatl-speaking people of the Triple Alliance. With his translators in place, Cortez began his negotiation with Tentlil. It being Easter Sunday, Cortez arranged for Tentlil and the other captains to see the full show, starting with Catholic Mass. Friar Olmedo chanted Mass, backed by Father Juan Diaz from a small makeshift altar. Diaz waved incense, not unlike the Aztec custom. Taking their cues from the Latin verse, the Spanish soldiers kneeled in the sand and stood, and kneeled, and prayed, and stood up, and kneeled throughout the service. Tentlil and his captains observed and quietly commented to each other on occasion when some aspect of this new faith piqued their interest. Tables were set up in camp and a fine dinner, made from the turkey and fruit brought by Tentlil's caravan, was served for all the men. Wine was poured for the captain's table, including for Tentlil. Cortez explained about the glory of King Charles in Castile. He also plied Tentlil for information about the politics of this land. The Aztec regional governor said that each town had a chief or governor, but that all of them in this land reported to one of the three heads of the Triple Alliance. Ultimately, all were subject to the Mexica Tlatuani of Tenochtitlan, Moctezuma. Cortez tried to segue back to his mission, that he sought friendship and wanted to go to the land of Mexico to see their king, Moctezuma, in person. Tenlil found this request to be a bit presumptuous on the part of a captain. He smiled, chuckled a bit to himself, then pushed back, saying it was unlikely that Moctezuma would see him, but that he would take the message to him. All this time, scribes were capturing these moments in drawings to report back to Moctezuma. Cortez had one more display of power for Tentlil, a message of sorts. After the meal and talk, they left the camp and headed out to the beach where Cortez had ordered the cavalry and artillery assembled. The horses were fully dressed with their armor and bells. The falconets and cannons were lined on the dune above the beach by the artillerymen Mesa. As the party strolled toward the sea, Marina translated from Nahuatl to Maya and Geronimo de Aguilar from Maya to Spanish. 
An atmosphere-shattering boom sounded above them. A cannonball ripped across nearby treetops, splintering several large branches with great noise. The shot dropped Tentleel and the rest of the entourage to their knees. Never in their lives had they seen or heard such a thing. Smoke had clouded the beach, the sulfur smell reminding some of the volcanoes. Through the smoke, Pedro de Alvarado charged the horses in formation up the beach toward the group. The noise of their armor snorting and hooffalls matching the thunderous roar of the cannons. The horses' eyes and armor glinted in the sun. It was the singular most powerful military display the Aztecs had ever seen. Seeing the Spaniards standing firm, Tentleel realized there was no danger and he began to inquire about the powerful scene. Tentleel examined a soldier's metal helmet, holding it in his hand, turning it, and knocking on the metal. Cortez told him he could have it if he returned it full of gold. He asked about the men and the horses, but Cortez shifted the conversation back to gold in Mexico. The sickly and constant need to always return to gold irked Tentleel. There seemed more to discuss at this momentous occasion, but he had seen enough, and he promised to report Cortez's request to Moctezuma. With that, Tentleel departed. He left the camp and many porters, women, and ranking officials there to support the Spanish with wood, tortillas, corn cakes, and other food. Part 4. Report to Moctezuma Behaving with calm and collected communication, Tentleel dutifully walked the 30 miles back to Kotashla. From there, he sent a message, along with the drawings done by the scribes, to Moctezuma. The message arrived at the palace, and Moctezuma, nervous for the news, asked for the messenger to be purified before he received the message. The man was blessed with incense, a sacrifice performed, and blood spattered upon him. After the ceremony, Moctezuma moved to his great hall to hear the message. The messenger entered with several men behind him holding a mate paper sheets with the drawings made in San Juan de Alua. Great Wei Tatuani, Moctezuma Shokoyotzin, we have met with these new foreigners. They are very different from us, with hairy faces and messy hair of many colors. Their leader is called Captain Cortez, different from the last Captain Grijalva, the messenger explained. He gestured toward the drawings behind him and said, The men wear armor of shining metal, and their weapons expel thunder and smoke with great noise, and anyone in front of these weapons is stricken to the ground as if by lightning. With them they have a set of great giant deer upon which they ride. They can control the animals and tell them where they want to go. The animals are as tall as a house and also armored for battle, he continued. Their dogs are enormous as well far larger than our dogs, with large teeth, long shaggy hair, and burning yellow eyes. They hunt men alongside these foreigners and their deer, as if the sacred dog Shalotl of the underworld was running alongside them. The messenger continued, uninterrupted, pointing at the scribe's rendering of Marina. And with them is a woman who speaks for them. She sits at the side of this Captain Cortez and speaks with the Mexica and the Maya and the foreigners. They say she is a princess from Cotasla who was traded into slavery. She was gifted to Cortez by Tabscub of the Yucatan Maya after his armies were massacred at Sintla. It is as if she was fated to be at his side. She informs him and speaks for him, the man said. Moctezuma listened to the man's words intently, hearing every detail as he continued. Lord Tentlil has ensured that they are pleased and cared for with good food, water, and fires. What this Captain Cortez wants, Great Tlatuani, is to come here to speak with you. Moctezuma leaned back in his seat, breathing in slowly, then out again. Deep dread set into Moctezuma's mind. He knew what the Spanish had done to Tabscub in Tabasco. And now his own men confirmed the power of their weapons, their beasts, and informed him of Marina, the bilingual woman. Moctezuma's stomach dropped as he had visions of these men entering Tenochtitlan, a native of this land at their side, guiding them. Glancing at the faces around him, Moctezuma perceived concern. 
Beams of sunlight caught the tobacco smoke lingering in the diplomatic chamber, where Moctezuma normally heard the pleas and complaints of his people. His counselors spoke words of encouragement, but the anxious tone in their voices belied their message. Some were scared and spoke of caution. Others were angered and leaning toward war. Something unprecedented was happening. I thank you for your message, although I wish you brought news of their departure, Moctezuma said pensively. Part 5 the Great Treasure. Moctezuma dispatched a group of officials to deliver the great treasure that had been commissioned after Grijalva's visit. The lords of the Triple Alliance had all agreed to provide the treasure and ask the men to take it to their king as a sign of their new friendship. And so the envoy was dispatched under the command of Quitlalpitoc. Among the caravan members were magicians who were to meet with, spy on, and cast spells upon Cortez. The men brought with them what seemed like thousands of porters, carrying supplies, food, and the great treasure itself. They passed through the hot lands of Chalco, through high-altitude pine forests, down around the volcanoes into the lush lowlands to Kutashla, where Tentlil joined them. Within four days, the Aztec caravan spotted the Spanish fleet, anchored near an island outpost they called Tecpan Tlayacac, and that the Spanish now called San Juan de Alua. Today, among the industrial ports of Veracruz, there is a colonial-era star fortress called Fuerte de San Juan de Alua, founded in 1535, a legacy of Cortez's explorations. Tentlil and Quitlalpitoc entered the camp with the hundreds of porters in tow. He found Cortez and approached, bowing and burning incense in the Mexica custom. Quitlalpitoc and a line of other ranking men did the same. Cortez summoned Marina to translate with Aguilar, and she took her place at his side, dressed neatly in her poncho-like wipil and long black hair. The two men greeted each other, and pleasantries were exchanged. Tentlil nodded to Quitlalpitoc, who ordered the petates, or woven mats, be placed on the ground. In a stunning show of wealth, Tentlil presented Cortez with the great treasure Moctezuma had commissioned for Grijalva. One by one, the porters placed each gold piece, each jade sculpture, carefully on the petates. The men were astonished at the amount of treasure. It kept coming. Tentlil placed around Cortez's neck a gold necklace. There was gold and silver jewelry, pectoral chest pieces, scepters, and statues of all kinds, turquoise masks, many feather shields, and hundreds of bundles of cotton robes like they wore. When the Europeans saw the enormous solid gold sun disk, as large as a wagon wheel, Bernal Diaz thought that it was not real and he could not believe it. The silver moon disk was similar in size. In addition to the wealth of treasures, Tentlil had arranged for more food to be delivered to the Spanish. All this time, Moctezuma's men were taking note of the camp and their mannerisms of the Spanish and their horses. The magicians wandered about and cast spells and cures, but mostly their observations were the more valuable effort. Tentlil finally delivered Moctezuma's message. The great speaker of Tenochtitlan was flattered that such noble men had come from such a distant and great kingdom, but that he would not be able to meet with them. To take the gifts presented today and return to their king with promise of a new friendship, and that was his final message. This did not sit well with Cortez, who began politicking immediately, thanking the Aztec men, giving them gifts, and urging that they reconsider and report back to Moctezuma that he would not accept this response. After some back and forth, Tentlil agreed to return to Tenochtitlan and request another visit of Moctezuma. He had agreed as much to get out of the situation as anything else. And with that, Tentlil left for Kutashla, where he would report to Moctezuma and await instruction. In the days after Tentlil had delivered this great treasure, the food deliveries to the Spanish began to wane, and growing hunger began to take over the Spanish camp. Their complaints to the ranking man Quitlalpitoc were nodded to and heard, but still less and less food arrived each day. Surely the appetite of a small European army had begun to drain the local surpluses, Plus, even the Aztec courtesies were straining under the helplessness of these hungry invaders. 
Cortez knew he could not stay in these mosquito-infested dunes, and with Aztec support fading, he would have to find a more permanent settlement with a good port. With that in mind, he sent Francisco de Montejo and two ships piloted by veterans Adaminos and Juan Alvarez north up the coast. They came upon a large rock overlooking the sea. Upon its slope was a town called Quiahuitlan. The ships continued north, coming close to the Panuco River, before turning back, and Cortez was not thrilled at the report. After four or five days, Tentlil arrived back in the dunes of San Juan de Lua with some porters and a bit more food. He presented Cortez with a small tribute of gold and other valuables, but this time pleaded with him to go, that Moctezuma would not meet with him. Cortez argued and demanded, but Tentlil stood firm. The next morning, the mixed Kotashla and Mexica camp was gone. Huitlopitoc and his people had pulled up stakes in the dark of night and left. The camp was quieter, darker, and colder now that the comforting smells of corn cakes and tortillas were gone. Some of the women they'd been using had left. The porters were gone too. Cortez took this as a hostile act and told his men to be on high alert, to sleep with their weapons ready. Part 6. Discontent and Political Maneuvering With the local Katashlan support gone, the never-ending mosquitoes picking them into pieces, and hunger nipping at their mental and physical well-being, tempers had flared in the Spanish camp. A group of men loyal to Cuba's governor, Diego Velazquez, had formed a faction that advocated for returning to Cuba. Arguments had broken out about staying or going, and about trading with locals for gold. The Velasquez faction thought that all the gold should be collected, the royal fifth deducted, and the rest distributed evenly according to the agreements. Others thought that the harsh journey and risk had earned the men a little freedom to trade for some personal gold. Partisans of both Cortez and Velasquez spent nights creeping around, whispering propaganda in each other's ears. Cortez's side argued for the glory of conquest, settlement, and Mexica gold, or else crawl back to Velasquez with a report. The Velasquez men spoke of departing for Cuba, sticking to a narrow interpretation of the order they were sent with. At one point, different men demanded to see the order, as if it were a founding document or biblical verse to be interpreted. Amidst this tumultuous political situation, and with the poor spirit in these miserable dunes, Cortez ordered the men to march for the town on the rock Montejo had spotted on his expedition north. The Velasquez men refused to advance, citing low supplies, numerous casualties, and overwhelming native numbers. The treasure already delivered from Moctezuma was enough, they argued, and that it was time to return to Cuba. It was not enough for Cortez, who knew there was more to be had. Cortez had cooked up a scheme with his captains Puerto Carrero, Pedro de Alvarado, his five brothers, plus a few others. Through his cunning deceits, Cortez proposed that he would begrudgingly agree with the Velasquez men, while his partisans, who were more numerous, would loudly protest and coax him back to founding a settlement. This little feign allowed Cortez to appear neutral. Next, with his trademark maneuvering and a similar manipulation, Cortez managed to have himself elected commander and chief justice of the new settlement called Villa Rica de la Vera Cruz. Immediately, they began electing officials for the new, as-yet-to-be-built town. Pedro de Alvarado was elected commander of expedition, a lead for quartermaster, Juan de Escalante as high constable, and so on. When news emerged of their shadowy election, the Velasquez men erupted in shouting, finger-pointing, and scuffles. Cortez agreed to let any who wanted to return to Cuba to go which settled some of the dissidents. Those who kept up their raucous disobedience were put in irons and held for several days under guard. In the end, no ship was allowed to sail to Cuba. The insurgency was no longer tolerated by Cortez. However, these disagreements were no chasm too wide for the emotionally skilled Cortez, who sent the bulk of the opposing faction on an expedition to find food, which they did. And when they returned and bellies had been fed, the mood shifted and Cortez was able to appease the dissidents. He released all but two of the men from chains. 
Juan Velasquez de Leon and Diego de Ordaz spent a couple extra days aboard the ship in irons, but even they came around. By the end of the disputes, Cortez had managed to put himself atop a new Spanish colony as the chief justice and military commander. It was the equivalent of a political Ponzi scheme, the illusion of power built upon more illusion of power, designed to elevate Cortez around Diego Velasquez and make him a direct report to King Charles. The first report from Cortez, the new chief justice to the king, would be a powerful argument for his cause and it would include the great treasures that Moctezuma had given to Cortez. Next time, in episode 4, Cortez begins work on the town of Villarica, laying groundwork for colonization, while Moctezuma strategizes against the Spanish. Thank you so much for listening. Gracias por escuchar. For a glossary of terms, more history, and info, visit mexicapodcast.com and check out the podcast menu. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Jeremy Lips.